man's main task is to give birth to himself. Eric from 1900 to 1980. Life is fraught with anxiety and powerlessness because of our separation from nature and from one another. These feelings can be overcome through searching out and devoting ourselves to the discovery of our own ideas and abilities, embracing our personal uniqueness, developing our capacity to love. The ability to find meaning in our lives is the defining characteristic of humankind. According to the German-American psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, it also determines whether we follow a path of joy and fulfillment or tread a road of dissatisfaction and strife. Fromm believed that although life is inherently painful, we can make it bearable by giving it meaning, through pursuing and constructing an authentic self. The ultimate aim of a human life is to develop what Fromm described as the most precious quality man is endowed with, the love of life. Life is inherently fraught with emotional frustration, according to Fromm, because man lives in a state of struggle. He is constantly trying to balance his individual nature, his existence as a separate being, with his need for connection. There is a part of man's inherent self that only knows how to exist in a united state with others, it lives at one with nature and at one with other people. Yet we see ourselves as separated from nature, and isolated from one another. Worse still, we have the unique capacity to ponder the fact of this separation and think about our isolation. Man, gifted with reason, is life being aware of itself. Fromm suggests that our separation from nature originated with the growth of intellect, which has made us aware of our separateness. It is our ability to reason and relate that lets us transcend nature. It provides the capabilities for productive living and affords us intellectual superiority, but it also makes us realize that we exist alone in this world. Reason makes us aware of our own mortality and the mortality of our loved ones. This understanding creates a chronic source of tension and an unbearable loneliness that we are always seeking to overcome. Man's inherent state of being is one of anxiety and hopelessness. But there is hope, Fromm insists because man can overcome his sense of isolation and alienation through finding his purpose. However, as we strive to become free, unique individuals, we still feel the need for unity with others, and in trying to balance these needs we may seek out the comfort of conforming to a group or an authority. This is a misguided approach, says Fromm, it is imperative to discover one's own independent sense of self and one's own personal views and value systems, rather than adhering to conventional or authoritarian norms. If we try to hand responsibility for our choices to other people or institutions we become alienated from ourselves, when the very purpose of our lives is to define ourselves through embracing our personal uniqueness, discovering our own ideas and abilities, and embracing that which differentiates each of us from other people. Man's main task is to give birth to himself. In doing so, he frees himself from confusion, loneliness, and apathy. Creativity and Love Paradoxically, Rom believes that the only way we can find the sense of wholeness we seek is through the discovery of our individuality. We can achieve this by following our own ideas and passions, and through creative purpose because creativity requires the courage to let go of certainties. Apostrophe. One of the critical ways in which man delivers himself from isolation is through his capacity to love. Fromm's concept of love is vastly different from popular understandings of the word. To Fromm, love is not an emotion, nor is it dependent on finding an object to love. It is an interpersonal creative capacity that one must actively develop as part of one's personality. He says it is an attitude, an ordination of character which determines the relatedness of the person to the whole world. Apostrophe. In terms of personal love for another, Fromm says that the main tenets are care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge, an objective knowledge of what other people truly want and need. Love is only possible through respecting the separateness and uniqueness of ourselves and of another, paradoxically. This is how we develop the ability to create connectedness. Love demands a great amount of respect for the other person as an individual, and it is based on autonomy, not a blending of personalities. 
In our overwhelming desire to connect and unify, we try to love but our relationships often result in an unloving imbalance. We think we are loving, but in reality we may be seeking another form of conformity. We say I love you when really we mean I see me in you, I will become you, or I will possess you. In loving, we try to lose our uniqueness, or steal from the other person. Our yearning to exist as one makes us want to see ourselves reflected in other people, which in turn leads us to artificially impose our own traits onto someone else. The only way to love, says Fromm, is to love freely, granting the other person their full individuality, to respect the other person's differing opinions, preferences, and belief systems. Love is not found by fitting one person into another's mold and it is not a question of finding the perfect match. It is, he says, union with somebody, or something, outside oneself, under the condition of retaining the separateness and integrity of one's own self. Many people spend vast amounts of time and money attempting to cultivate the self that they feel is most worthy of acceptance, and most likely to result in being loved or desired. This is futile because only a person who has a strong sense of self, and can stand firmly within their own understanding of the world, is able to give freely to others and love in an authentic way. Those who tend to orient themselves toward receiving love instead of being loving will fail, they will also seek to establish a receiving relationship in other ways, always wanting to be given things, material or immaterial, rather than to give. These people believe the source of all good things lies outside themselves, and they constantly feel the need to acquire, though this brings no relief. Personality Types From identified several personality types that he called non-productive, because they enable people to avoid assuming true responsibility for their actions and prevent productive, personal growth. Each of the four main non-productive types, receptive, exploitative, hoarding, and marketing, have both positive and negative sides. A fifth type, necrophilus, is unremittingly negative, and a sixth type, the productive personality, is Fromm's ideal. In reality, our personalities are generally drawn from a mix of the four main types. A person with a receptive orientation is said to live passively in the status quo, accepting the lot handed to them. These people follow rather than lead, they have things done to them. In extremes, this is the stance of the victim, but on the positive side, it is rich in devotion and acceptance. Fromm compares this type to the peasants and migrant workers of history. The exploitative orientation thrives on taking from others, exploitative people take what they need instead of earning or creating. However, they show extreme self-confidence and strong initiative. This type is typified by historical aristocracies who took power and wealth from indigenous populations to line their own pockets. Hoarders are always seeking friends in high places and rank even loved ones in terms of their value, seeing them as something owned. Power hungry and ungenerous, at best they are pragmatic and economical. Historically, these are the middle classes, or bourgeoisie, that rise in great numbers during economic depressions. The last of the main types is the marketing orientation. These people are obsessed with image and with how to successfully advertise and sell themselves. Every choice is evaluated in terms of reflected status, from the clothes, cars, and vacations they buy to marriage into the right family. At worst, they are opportunistic, tactless, and shallow, at best, they are highly motivated, purposeful, and energetic. This type is most representative of modern society, in its ever-growing acquisitiveness and self-consciousness. The most negative personality type, necrophilus, seeks only to destroy. Deeply afraid of the disorderly and uncontrollable nature of life, necrophilus types love to talk about sickness and death, and are obsessed with the need to impose law and order. They prefer mechanical objects to other people. In moderation, these people are pessimistic naysayers whose glasses are perpetually half empty, never half full. Fromm's last personality type, the productive orientation, genuinely seeks and finds a legitimate solution to life through flexibility, learning, and sociability. 
aiming to become one with the world and so escape the loneliness of separation, productive people respond to the world with rationality and an open mind, willing to change their beliefs in the light of new evidence. A productive person can truly love another for who they are, not as a trophy or safeguard against the world. Fromm calls this brave person the man without a mask. Fromm's work has a unique perspective, drawing on psychology, sociology, and political thinking, especially the writings of Karl Marx. His writing, aimed at a mainstream audience, influenced the general public more than academia, mainly because of his insistence on the freedom of ideas. He is nonetheless recognized as a leading contributor to humanistic psychology. The Four Non-Productive Personality Types Receptive types have no choice but to accept their roles, and never fight for change or betterment. Exploitative types are aggressive and self-centered, and typically engage in acts of coercion and plagiarism. Hoarding types fight to retain what they have, and are always seeking to acquire more. Marketing types sell everything, especially their own image. Eric Fromm Eric Fromm was the only child of his Orthodox Jewish parents, and grew up in Frankfurt am Main, Germany. A thoughtful young man, he was initially influenced by his Talmudic studies, but later turned toward Karl Marx and socialist theory, together with Freud's psychoanalysis. Driven by the need to understand the hostility he witnessed during World War I, he studied jurisprudence, then sociology, to Ph.D. level, before training in psychoanalysis. After the Nazis took power in Germany in 1933, Fromm moved to Switzerland and then New York, where he established a psychoanalytic practice and taught at Columbia University. Fromm married three times and had a well-documented affair with Karen Horney during the 1930s. In 1951, he left the U.S. to teach in Mexico, returning 11 years later to become professor of psychiatry at New York University. He died in Switzerland at the age of 79. Key Works 1941 The Fear of Freedom 1947, Man for Himself 1956, The Art of Loving In Context Approach, Humanistic Psychoanalysis Before 1258-61 The Sufi mystic Rumi says that the longing of the human soul comes from separation from its source. 1950s Rolla May says that the true religion consists of facing life's challenges with purpose and meaning, through accepting responsibility and making choices. After 1950 Karen Horney says that the neurotic self is split between an idealized and a real self. 1960s Abraham Maslow defines creativity and thinking of others as characteristics of self-actualized people. 1970s Fritz Perls says that we must find ourselves in order to achieve self-actualization. It seems that nothing is more difficult for the average man to bear than the feeling of not being identified with a larger group. Know thyself is one of the fundamental commands that aim at human strength and happiness. Life has an inner dynamism of its own, it tends to grow, to be expressed, to be lived. Eric Fromm